guess this is our cue to get started. Welcome, and thank you for uh, showing up for this talk. I know we're up against some serious competition. Um, my name is Case Leune. I'm the Information Security Officer over at the Delphi University, which is, uh, is New York, Long Island area. And with me is uh, Adam Dodge. Hi, I'm Adam Dodge. I'm the Information Technology Security Officer for Eastern Illinois University, which is uh, rural Illinois. And we'll be basically uh, doing a, a talk on information security in higher education. The, the driving force for this talk was whenever we go to places, we hear, oh, you're at a school. You don't have to worry about security. Actually, we do, uh, but for a lot of different reasons. Um, let's set the stage a bit. Anyone here has any of the three or four letter acronyms behind their names? Uh, CISA, CISM, uh, CISSP, stuff like that? You do. Okay, good. So risk management, um, protect intellectual property, uh, all those kinds of, of good things must sound very familiar to you. You must know that um, there is a separation between an information owner and an information custodian. Um, You've got to know that there is a default deny policy on the network. Nothing gets done without explicit approval. Um, that you are able to keep your employees accountable for the stuff they do. Great rules, but unfortunately in higher ed they typically do not apply or do not work. Which makes um, our environment a little bit more challenging uh, than a typical corporate environment. We have interesting users to possibly use the understatement of the year. We have people who are curious by nature, um, able and willing to break stuff, um, and yet cannot really be held accountable for it because that's what they're supposed to do. How else are you going to learn that something breaks until you actually do it? Um, every sys admin that I know has had a few oops cases in his life where executing that one command and suddenly everything is silent and there is one thing that I absolutely dread, and that is a silent system administrator, where suddenly the typing will stop, and the talking will stop, and the music goes off. And he gets up and walks over to his boss and says, oops. Oops is not good, especially in an IT environment. Um, at the university, we have a little bit of a different situation. Um, we have a lot of administrators, but we also have a lot of local users that have high privileges on their own machines and sometimes even on uh, departmental machines. Um, the key players in higher ed are um, staff, faculty, students, administration, parents. Uh, most companies don't have to worry about the parents of their clients. We do. Um, government and of course a lot, a lot of third parties. Let's start out by how we are not different from a lot of um, the environment that you're used to working in. Administration are the people, uh, like me, who don't have much to do with uh, teaching or education or research, but we keep the place going. We make sure that bills get sent out, that they are paid, that people are employed, people are screened. In that, a university is just a normal business. Um, our job is to make sure that the university runs and that it's still there a year from now. We don't have anything like special privileges. We have our machines, we do our job, and that's about it. Faculty is a little different, and we'll see um, why they're different further down. But they're the ones that provide the education and the research. Students, well, who hasn't been a student, um, students are, most of them at least, or well, some of them, are curious by nature. They're learning things, they're doing stuff that they um, should be doing, and sometimes stuff that they should not be doing. And then there's the parents of the students who are typically paying for that student's stay at the university. And they have a legitimate interest in some of the things that are going on. But at the same time, there's a lot of um, legal requirements that we may not be able to give them a lot of information that they do need. Uh, government and third parties we all have to deal with. Um, at the university, some terms that you'll be hearing regularly are uh, the provost, who is basically the boss of faculty. The provost is in charge of teaching um, and research. The registrar is typically the person who deals with student educational records. She makes sure that your grades get recorded, that uh, he or she, in our case it's a she, um, that your information is up to date. And she is typically the data owner of student educational records. 
we have some, certain, uh, some issues in higher ed. Um, oh, by the way, if there are questions, jump in. Um, first of all, intellectual property. In the case of faculty and students, most of the time, the university does not own the intellectual property. The way that copyright law is, is phrased is that the creator of a work owns the copyright unless it is a work for hire. So basically, you were hired to create something, then the person paying you, or at least hiring you, owns that copyright. In higher ed, that is not the case. Well, that is the case, but nine times out of 10, through some um, collective bargaining agreement or additional contracts, universities sign over any and all rights to faculty members. So as an information security professional, where we are taught to protect the university's, the organization's intellectual property, at the university, that is really only the administrative information. The faculty owns their own stuff. In other words, if a faculty member decides to leave the organization and at the same time decides to take all his educational materials with him, that is fine. That is fine. Hopefully, we'll have a license to use the material until we have found a replacement. But that is not necessarily always the case. If a faculty member decides to post all of his slides or all of his research results, for that matter, to the internet, that is his prerogative. We cannot do anything to stop him. Compare that to, an to a commercial environment where the research and development unit decides to post all their um, early research results publicly for everyone to see. On the one hand, it makes our life a lot easier. Um, we don't control it, therefore we really don't have much to say about it. And maybe we don't have so much protection requirements. Maybe we do, um, but that depends on the situation. Students also create a lot of work. They create assignments, they do research results, and that depends per institutions. Some of the institutions explicitly make anything done by a student owned by his supervisor, which is cheap labor. Um, other institutions will allow the students to retain that copyright themselves. It is uh, specific per instance. But compare it to a commercial environment where this is typically not the case. If you're hired to do a job, your boss will own it. Patents are slightly different. Uh, patents are inventions. Um, those are regularly retained by the university with some kind of revenue sharing agreement with the faculty member or the faculty members. So where we say protect the organization's intellectual property, we will still do that as information security professionals in higher ed. It's just that we have a lot of owners of that information throughout our organization and they decide what the rules are and not us which is interesting every now and then. At the university, there is something called academic freedom. It's one of the foundations of um, research, of science, and of teaching. And part of that academic freedom means that a member of faculty is able and allowed to pursue whatever he wants to pursue. So there is no director or supervisor who says, you are now going to research this particular topic. The faculty member decides that himself. Um, with that comes a expectation of privacy. In other words, if a faculty member decides to pursue a certain topic, he will not be monitored. We will not censor his publications. We will not look over his shoulder to see what he is doing. From a proactive network monitoring point of view, that means that we cannot look at what goes on on our network unless it is administrative data. But we do not look by default at what's happening on our research side and on our teaching side, which makes it hard to detect certain patterns. We can look at traffic flows, but even there you're getting in a gray area. Of course, there is always the matter of uh, a policy where you can state, you know what, if we think something is going on, we can open up an investigation, but that is um, a very sensitive topic to a lot of faculty members. So yeah, the freedom of academic pursuit does grant faculty members an ex a reasonable expectation of privacy. In other words, we will not look at what they're doing on our network. Tenure, another thing. Accountability. If an employee does something, you can yell at him and add consequences. A tenured professor you can yell at, but he can shrug it off. You have to be making a very, very strong case 
for a tenured professor to be really in trouble. So where certain things might, from an information security perspective, be bad, with a capital B, a tenured professor might still be able to get away with it because of his tenure, which basically means that his appointment is guaranteed until he decides to leave and not until we kick him out. Of course, there's always exceptions. Um, we have protected information also. Student educational records are protected by law. Um, you cannot just publish uh, the fact even that a student is taking classes at a university, let alone grades for a certain thing, uh, for a certain class, to anywhere in the public. Um, and that extends to faculty members. If a faculty member decides to extend certain information that he is not allowed to do, uh, published by law, he can be held accountable, but for typically his day-to-day -day work, he cannot be held accountable. So we do have a reasonable expectation of privacy, rather than we do not have a reasonable expectation of privacy. And as far as accountability goes, there really is none to a certain extent for members of faculty, including students which makes the information security role harder than it is in other environments. Um, yeah, take it. Um, you know, another thing that most of you, hopefully a lot of you within higher ed, are so familiar with the open networks that go on. Uh, a lot of universities have high-speed networks um, and large bandwidth connections you know, to serve the mission of the university, the research goals, the educational goals. Um, and a lot of these, to meet those goals, to meet the uh, free flow of information, uh, the academic freedom, the ability for the faculty and the students to engage in research uh, to drive the educational goals of the university, there are very few restrictions on network traffic at the end points, which is something you don't often see in commercial environments. Uh, this especially gets true when you start dealing with on-campus, if you have a high on-campus population, um, in which you know a lot of universities treat these individuals as almost renters in, a, in uh, respect instead of you know, your traditional employee environment. Um, there's also uh, you know, a lot of restrictions on equipment that can be placed. Uh, a lot of universities kind of have grown um, organically their network environments and so they've got a large mix of equipment, a large mix of uh, cabling, of infrastructure equipment, of endpoint usage. Um, so that's kind of unique in that it's difficult to get uh, products where you can get, uh, in the commercial environments, you can get a standard operating system or standard, uh, I guess, computer or what have you. It becomes very difficult when you start dealing with multiple OSs, multiple OS versions, um, some of which may be used for research, some of use, which may be used in the classroom for teaching, some of which may be used faculty as their preferred um, equipment of choice. Uh, going back to the residence halls, um, you actually can get into a lot of political problems, especially if your environment uh, w in which your university or college is located has to compete heavily with off-campus housing. Uh, you start running into situations where if you try to put heavy restrictions to control and monitor the network, or the network environment of your residence halls, where that can be viewed as a negative towards attracting students to the on-campus housing. Um, also with the on-campus housing with your students, um, you know, there's a lot of regulations out there that are almost requiring universities uh, to become proxy force or proxy police for different regulatory environments, uh, most likely copyright infringement. I'm sure if you're all in higher ed, you're familiar with the name Jeremy Landis. I've nicknamed him the, unf uh, unfortunately, the most hated man in higher ed. If you're not familiar with that, that is the individual that is on all of the RIAA copyright infringement notices that go out. Uh, even more than just the equipment, um, the open environment of the machines, as Case alluded to, uh, it gets very difficult to put firm controls on a lot of these machines because you start running into areas in which you could actually be restricting a faculty member's ability to interact with their students. Um, a lot of faculty members are starting to push and use social media a lot, so trying to restrict the information that's flowing out of these machines onto these social networks and environments that aren't owned by the university can actually be heavily restricted because it is a good way to engage with the students, to teach the students, um, and better facilitate uh, the educational goals of the university. 
Um, you know, another issue is a lot of universities, uh, larger universities in particular, um, they have a decentralized environment. Whereas you have a central IT uh, infrastructure, but then a lot of your different schools will have their own IT, IT staff running their own systems. Um, so you really get into this problem. You also have grant-sponsored research, which have their own rules, their own regulations, their own needs to uh, collaborate with individuals outside of your network. Um, you know, third parties, um, you know, not to blame anybody, but I'm sure those of you that have been monitoring security and higher ed are familiar with the unfortunate um, SunGuard higher ed laptop that was stolen that affected, I think at last count I had monitored it, I think it was around 20 different schools, um, which is the consulting arm of trying to have them help build their web CT or their banner systems, uh, which is ERP, if you're not familiar with it, it's just an ERP system. Um, so you've got a lot of third parties that are hosting your own information, um, and so that becomes unique in and of itself in that a lot of universities do not, um, or I, I should say a lot of universities do consult with outside third party contractors because for budgeting reasons or what have you, um, it's just easier to get outside support than ha maintain and build and maintain the internal expertise available. Okay, so here's some lessons. Um, both Case and I have, our, our roles are relatively new at our universities, so these are some of the lessons that we've learned. Um, first one, obviously know your customer. That's one every, every information security professional is, available, or is familiar with. There are really three distinct groups um, that you mainly have to worry about in higher ed, that being students, your faculty, and your administration. And really one of the goals is each of these groups has different accesses to different information. Um, so that really has to be handled uniquely, and each must be handled differently. Um, you know, so just to kind of walk through these, when dealing with the administration, um, you know, most of, your, most of your administrative, your officials are worried about security. They are worried about uh, the security of the data. Um, the problem is, is that a lot of them don't understand, fully understand the risks that are involved. So when dealing with these individuals, one of the best ways to do it um, is to clearly lay out the facts, lay out the risks, lay out the environment, give them as much information as possible. Uh, one thing, but you know, absolutely don't lie to them because that can, you know, FUD can be a powerful tool, but I don't recommend it because it can come back to hurt you. You know, one of the things that I like to do is look at what other schools are doing, uh, especially similar schools, uh, perhaps neighboring schools, schools that have the same type of environment as you do kind of look at the, uh, at the laws, develop contacts with these people. Uh, the goal here is really, like I said, to provide as much information as possible to help them understand the risks so that proper decisions and risk management can be handled. Um, you know, never, and, and one of the things, you know, this is a mistake that, oh, I just got louder. This is a mistake that I've been known to make um, in the past is when you do approach these people with these risks, with your concerns, of course, always come to them with a concrete solution in mind. Um, you don't garner a lot of support with your administrative staff if you just walk up there with, hey, this is a problem, it needs to be fixed, and they say, what do we need to do, and you just kind of shrug and walk away. When dealing with faculty, um, you know, faculty are, I like dealing with them. Um, they are unique in that if these are people that really have spent their entire professional careers, you know, training and logic and learning how to rip apart arguments. And so when you approach faculty, you know, the goal here is to always have the information to back up your claims, but also approach it in a collaborative environment. Don't approach them in a way in which you are heavy-handedly trying to force controls on them. Instead, try to in, uh, invite them into the conversation, get them involved, and so you can work with them to come up with a solution that will work for everybody. Yeah, the point you made earlier, uh, do not use fear, uncertainty, and doubt, is absolutely and positively true for faculty members. <clears throat> as soon as they get the feeling, and I'm one of them, um, actually, um, as soon as we get the feeling, I should be saying then, that you are trying to scare us into a certain thing, you will lose our attention, and you cannot hold us accountable anyway. Um, so when you go there, don't try to scare people into doing things. 
try to explain to them that there is a risk. Maybe the risk isn't all that big, but it is something that must be addressed, whether that is from a regulatory point of view, whether it is from an internal policy, or whether it just makes good sense in the end. Um, a lot of people working in higher ed, especially on the administrative side, don't necessarily believe it, but faculty members are humans too. Um, yeah, I know. It's, it's, it might be new, but in that case, that would be the headline for this talk. Faculty members are humans too. And in the end, they want to do a good job. Uh, their impression of what a good job might be might differ from what is yours. But one short way of not getting their buy-in is by telling them what to do. Um, most universities, um, faculty is self-governing which means that the administrative side of the shop does not tell the academic side what to do. The fact that they're self-governing means that they have a lot of freedom, but that means also that they have to take a lot of responsibility. And if you, as long as you explain to them what that responsibility is that they have to take, most of them are actually willing to do it. It might take a while. You will have spent a lot of time talking to them, um, providing them with facts, providing them with logic. But once you convince a faculty member of the fact that you are right and that you have a valid argument, he will just go about to any length to make something happen. So yeah, it takes a lot of time to deal with them because you cannot tell them what to do. You have to convince them what to do. But once you have done that, you have an incredible strong buy-in. And of course, the last group is the students. And I mean, you know, you kind of get the, the feeling that the students just don't care. They just want their internet access, and they don't want to have to jump through hoops. They don't want to have to have AV. They don't want to have to, you know, make sure their machines are clean. They just want full, unfettered access to the students internet. Students are like politicians. Four years from now, they're gone. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, luckily, that is changing. I've seen it change. A lot more students are becoming more aware of information security risks. And so they're willing to, as long as it's explained to them why they're doing, you know, why these rules are in place, um, and as long as it's made clear uh, to them up front why it's being done, um, I've had great luck with a lot of our, with our students uh, talking to them about various issues that we deal with. And um, the one thing that you have with students is that you do have leverage, because in the end, we are the ones giving them their final uh, exam and their final diplomas. So, that also helps. So, you know, as, as Case talked about before, you know, information security has really no place in a traditional academic environment um, in terms of what the actual goals of your academic environments are, uh, be it the free open exchange of information. Um, so, you know, really what are colleges, they're, they're places of learning, they're places of exploration, they're places of research. Um, you know, these, these, these kind of intellectual discussions that, uh, go, uh, that are ongoing are really central, and that's the goal. And so trying to put a lot of heavy restrictions on that and a lot of monitoring on that becomes very, very difficult. Um, you know, and also, for those of you that do have residence hall networks, um, they are unique challenges. They are de facto renters. That's what they are. Um, you are, in fact, now no longer supporting the university, but you are actually acting as an ISP for the students. And um, it becomes very difficult, especially with the increased um, regulatory requirements that are coming down. Um, you know, I kind of hate saying that because obviously the goal is not to be compliant, the goal is to be secure. But when you have things like H.R. 4137, which is the Higher Education Opportunity Act, which does mandate administrative and technical controls be put in place um, to prevent, for example, illegal P2P on campus, it does become rather difficult. Um, However, you know, the goal of restrictions that you do have to put in place don't necessarily have to be the limitation on the exchange of information. Uh, it really should be the secu securing that exchange of information, um, and that's one of the best ways I've found of, a, of approaching it. Um, you know, it's about protecting the institution while at the same, protecting the institution while at the same time ensuring that that free flow of information can continue uninterrupted um, and in a manner that protects the information being distributed as well as the individual's ability to distribute that information as they wish because, like Kay said, a lot of times they are the own owners of that information, so they do get to make the decision on how they want it sent out. Yeah, academic freedom. Uh, I mentioned it before. Um, faculty members are self-governing. That means that they can choose whatever research they want to pursue. Um, they cannot be censored. You cannot look over their shoulder. And of course, um, I'm 
stating these things a little stronger than in practice they usually are, but this is what it comes down to. Um, if, as an information security professional or a networking guy, you see a problem on your network and you start looking into it and you start capturing some data, you'd better be sure that you're in a covered position, that you n know that you can do this. Um, there have been plenty of situations where faculty members learn about this, where there is some form of network monitoring going on and there is a major upheaval within an institution. Well, in the end, it's academia, so a major upheaval also has some um, restrictions on it, but still, you make a lot of people really, really upset. Um, we have academic freedom, um, and that's actually one of the, 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 the next points that we're trying to make, um, is, but that is limited to a certain uh, extent. The other point is that we made, and that is something that you have to keep in mind, is that the university typically does not own a lot of that copyright or of the patents or whatever intellectual property you may have. Um, and that is a problem. There are the copyright uh, laws have something called fair use, which means that you can use certain copyrighted materials for uh, teaching and education, but using some copyrighted materials does not include whole chapters of a book. So where that protection um, um, is there to protect faculty members, at the same time, it is also our role, uh, unfortunately, while it should really be much more of a role of a legal team, to explain to them why they cannot do certain things, um, why you cannot just take a book and copy it and hand it out to your students. Um, that is all copyright, and as unfortunately, because the DMCA notices, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act notices, usually involve a fairly high IT involvement, because in the end it's IT trying to trace back those data flows to a user. Uh, somehow, and that's true for most institutions that I know of, any copyright issue ends up with IT. Um, whether it is copyright infringements by users or users that feel that their copyrights are being infringed on. Um, my perspective is much more uh, copyright in either way is not an IT problem. Um, copyright is a legal problem um, or a legal feature, however you want to call it, but it is something that legal affairs should predominantly be worrying about and we can assist them with it, but unfortunately that is not always the case in higher ed. Um, which means that if you have 100 faculty members, you have 100 information owners on your network. And typically, those 100 information owners decide themselves what level of protection they need for their information. And as IT is much more a service provider now, we have to facilitate just about every one of them, which makes it challenging. Um, so yeah, we have academic freedom, and academic freedom is a good thing. It allows people to really push the boundary of what is known or what may be even be accepted by society. Um, those how, that is how some of the major improvements have been made because the faculty members were protected and because they could push those boundaries, but at the same time, it also imposes a lot of restrictions and a lot of problems for us who worry about what can you do with our networks as far as acceptable use goes. But we also have a lot of business data. And in that case, higher education is not a unique environment. There's a whole lot of regulations that we have to worry about, and most people aren't aware. Um, higher education has to comply with something called FERPA, which is something that's fairly well known. It's a federal law that basically says, if you are enrolled in an institute for higher education, um, your student educational records are protected, to the point that when a parent of a student calls up, we cannot disclose any information on that student unless that student has approved. At the same time, we know full well that that parent is paying for the tuition, which is always an interesting argument that, in our case, the registrar is having with a lot of the, the, the parents. What do you mean I'm paying you X amount of dollars per year and you cannot tell me if my, my son or my daughter passed this exam? And the answer is that is correct. You'll have to go to your son or your daughter and ask them to give you access to their records. Yes. Ha. 
Um, less, uh, first comment, I am not a lawyer. Um, so <laughs> whatever I say, take with a grain of salt. Um, basically, yes, to any, well, and, uh, you take it. <laughs> That's probably easier. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, again, you know, I'm also not a lawyer. Um, generally, my interpretation of FERPA, uh, where you have to get very careful, is if it can be attributed back to the fact that the student is enrolled in the university, um, because FERPA does allow you students the ability to opt out of uh, to opt out of enrollment, I guess, information, for lack of a better word, um, so that if the student has said, you know, the university cannot disclose the fact that I'm, in fact, enrolled in this university, the fact that you have a test record from that student for that university, if that information does perhaps, uh, were to perhaps get exposed, you do potentially have a, a problem there with FERPA. Yeah, the, the university is allowed to designate certain information as directory information, um, which, which has slightly different rules. But for example, enrollment is a very good example. Um, many more universities are now doing stuff like um, um, iTunes University, where they will record full lectures and put them up on the internet for everyone to, to view. But if at the same time, um, by watching a lecture put up by, say, my institution, if I can visually see certain students in the audience, I can make an assumption that that student is taking classes at my institution. Am I now in violation of FERPA? Probably, because from that information, you can deduce that that information is enrolled in my class. Um, am I allowed to put stuff up on iTunes University in the first place? Because a faculty member owns his educational materials, not a university. So you might have to go to the point where each faculty member has to explicitly sign off that certain uh, lectures or presentations can be shared. Very often faculty is organized in, uh, in, in unions. So you might be able to play this through a collective uh, bargaining agreement, but anytime you make a change to a collective bargaining agreement, that's not something that goes very fast. Well, that is another common factor in higher ed because everything has to be done by consensus and especially uh, everything on the faculty side of life, nothing goes very fast. Um, but once it's there, it's there to stay. Um, because nothing goes very fast, <laughs> even changing things that you were, uh, were trying to implement. So back to that, uh, that, that business data. Um, universities do business, uh, especially private universities, um, make their money um, from only a few sources. Uh, tuition is one of them. Um, 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 endowments and grants are typically the other uh, large factor of money coming in, although recently that doesn't seem to be happening very often. Um, but we have regular business type data also. We have accounts payable, we have a human resources department, we have payroll, fortunately. Um, we manage investments. Um, universities that offer medical services um, have um, protected health information. So you get compliance regulations. Um, not only do you have to worry about PCI DSS, because you do take credit card payments often, you have to worry about HIPAA. If you provide um, federal loans, you have to worry about GLBA. Um, there's a whole bunch more uh, rules and regulations that apply to universities that um, don't necessarily stand out at the first glance. Um, and there's so much going on as far as, as um, uh, legal requirements that we are like any other business. Um, um, everyone has to worry about legislation, whether it's uh, federal level, state level, or even a lower level. Um, large number of non-academic regulations must be met. Yeah, you just basically mentioned that. Um, balance, guidance, and control, yeah. Yeah, um, you know, at my university we, you know, the decentralized versus centralized, you know, is unique to different universities. Obviously, all uh, the universities or institutions that all of you worked at, I'm assuming most of you are within higher ed, so I could be wrong in that. Um, you may have, you know, you may not have a decentralized control. You may have been able to pull all IT functions in-house and run through a central IT. However, you know, I don't necessarily view decentralization as a bad thing. In fact, I think it can be a very powerful, um, uh, a very powerful setup if it's handled right. Um, the main reason is because the size and scope of college and university information resources um, can make centralized control very, very difficult, uh, especially when you start dealing with going down to the end user if you have a limited information security staff. 
So really, the goal here, um, you know, distributing the control allows authority and responsibility to also be distributed. So really, the end goal then is that what instead of trying to do strong control centrally, what you want to do is provide strong guidance centrally. Um, and really, the whole point of creating these guidelines, creating goals, objectives for the information resource owners is not to tell them you can only do X, Y, and Z with your information systems. The goal instead is to go to them and say, if you want to put this information on one of your information resources, you must, be, must meet at minimum A, B, and C. And as long as you're meeting those, you can use the information however you wish or however you need to. Um, so again, though, you know, as the whole point of this talk, the goal here is baby steps. Um, you know, it, what you want to do is look at your information infrastructure, look at your current security controls, look at your security environment, try to pick out the most pressing issues, or, you know, and to go along with those, maybe you can grab a couple low-hanging fruit, things that will be easy to correct, give you some easy wins right off the front, so that you can use that to build momentum and build understanding. Yes. Um, no. Yeah, um, I haven't either. Um, I have never been in a situation where I did have to go to the trustees, well, other than audit uh, reports and audit findings, um, because um, although it might take a long time, most people in higher ed are open to reason. Um, and if you want to push something through very, very fast, every now and then it's okay to do something and beg for forgiveness later. Um, but like we said, most things in higher ed don't go very fast. And, and the only thing that you need to get a, and that would actually be jumping to the, to the next uh, lesson. Um, actually, I just wanted to, one more point here uh, that your question reminded me. You know, fortunately, I haven't had to go to the Board of Trustees. Um, because really what I've found is that having these one-on-one -on -one conversations with the information resource owners or the data custodians or, or you know, just the end users in charge of the information, once you kind of explain to them the goals, the risks, and really once they understand um, that the responsibility for protecting this information is then, after that kind of has clicked, the light bulb moment has gone off, I've had some of the best conversations I've ever had with staff and faculty once that realization has happened. I started getting absolutely outstanding information from them. Um, they started actually coming to me with concerns and questions. Uh, so really, baby steps building that foundation has helped me avoid having to go to the board absolutely, of trustees. Absolutely, and avoid fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Yeah. And so hopefully I won't ever have to. <laughs> um, but um, I can see where for some changes, especially things that need to be made quickly or issues that you have strong resistance that may have to happen. Yeah, and that brings us to the, the last real lesson is that whenever things need to go very quickly, there is something wrong. Um, normally, uh, if you are able to take the time to plan things out and to make gradual changes, you will get it done. But every now and then a situation pops up where you have to move very quickly. And usually that is in a situation where it is about containment, containing damages. And that is something that you may have to go all the way up to your board of trustees for. In our case, um, our um, president and vice president um, decided to sign off on it. And that is implement a state-of-the-art incident response capability. Because we cannot go very deeply in monitoring our networks, um, because we cannot tell people what to do and what not to do, means that a lot of the prevention that um, you would typically do as an information security professional, you can only do to a limited extent in higher ed. Typically, you can do it for administrative information, to, to business data, but you cannot do it for faculty data and you cannot do it for student data. So when something that does go wrong, when that phone call does come in on Friday afternoon at 5 p.m. when everyone just left, you need to make sure that you have the authority to act and tell people what to do. Of course, whenever you use that authority, you'd better be very good at explaining why you used it afterwards. But you need to be able to pick up the phone, call your networking staff and say, kill that service now, kill that server now, revoke this access now. And there is no argument and there is no faculty member that will call back two minutes later and says, why are you doing this? I'm just teaching a class. But at the same time, you've got to remember that for a lot of universities, teaching that class is their core business. So if you decide to take out the course management system that is used by, I don't know, 200, 200 classes in parallel, yeah, you need to have that authority, but you also need to have a very, very good argument later on to possibly explain to the Board of Trustees 
why you decided to take down that course management system and left four or five thousand students basically sitting in the dark without being able to generate revenues. So, but because you cannot do as much prevention as you can do in a corporate environment, for example, um, I know that in most corporate environments, I used to work there, um, typical thing is your desktop or your laptop does not run with administrative privileges. I have not been to a university where at least half of the desktops, if not more, doesn't run with administrative privileges. So very simple things, uh, very preventative steps that you could take, you cannot take. And that's why you need to focus on response rather than on prevention. Of course, as much prevention as you can do, do. Um, prepare to spend a lot of time convincing people that you need to do it, but at the same time, be ready to act when stuff does happen. Um, form some form of a computer security incident response team, even if that is just a team of one that calls in people as they need it, um, but be aware that, a that an organization must have some form of response capability. Don't make it a technical function. Uh, make sure that your registrar for the student educational records is on it, that if you have a, a vice president of academic affairs or a provost, that at least she has some role in there or he has some role in there. Make sure that everyone is represented on it. If you have even a, a student senate, uh, you might not give them an active role, but you should at least establish some context ahead of time that you tell them about it, um, keeping in mind that they may not be able to relay a lot of the information, but it has helped me in the past where we had incidents that would affect a number of students where I would call up this guy uh, in the student senate and say, hey, you know what, this is going to happen. If you hear anything back from other students, reassure them that it's okay and that we are working on it because very naturally, students will listen to other students much more than they will listen to some help desk person or to a system administrator over in IT. So get that computer security incident response team uh, labeled and give them the authority that they need to act quickly, but at the same time, have them realize that acting quickly might have implications and, and that they need to be ready to defend those decisions. Um, yeah, so basically when you put all this together, we are not all that different from commercial environments, as long as you keep in mind the intellectual property issues, that a lot of the intellectual property that is out there may not be owned by the, IT, by the, the organization, um, that your stakeholders will have much more freedom than they have in a commercial environment. So don't come with need to know, least privilege, uh, separation of duty, um, um, no reasonable expectation of privacy, because that will only apply to a very small section of the university, uh, typically the administration or a certain level of administration only. Your faculty won't be affected by it, your students won't be affected by it, and those are the people that make up the vast majority of your population. Um, those are also the people that bring in the money in the end, so those are also a consideration. And do not underestimate the role of security management, um, especially incident management um, in higher ed. And you will find strange stuff. Um, there is, that is not a question, that is not a recommendation, that is a fact. Um, anything that has ever been produced that has a CPU or some form of management, a memory in a device will be on a university's network. Um, it will not be patched, um, it will be sending out strange traffic, and it will be hacked. Um, but you will find it uh, eventually, and then you've got to be ready to respond to it. And I think those were the main points that we wanted to make. Um, we have about uh, 10 minutes left, so please open it up for questions. I'll move over it a little bit so I'm not glaring into the lights. Yes. Um, um, I am very lucky to say that in any environment that I have worked, whether that's higher ed or commercial environments, I have never lost sleep over anything. <laughs> um, maybe job security, but that's a long time ago. Um, no. Um, the things that worry the most um, are, I think, like any commercial environment, is getting appropriate buy-in to take certain measures. Um, and 
where in the commercial environments I used to work, it was often enough to go to senior management or to the CEO or to CIO and get them to say, okay, do this and we'll make it work. That does not work at the university, um, especially not if um, faculty or students are um, involved. Um, um, for me, you know, usually it comes down to, um, well, I'm a little neurotic, so obviously I spend a lot of time obsessing that I've missed something or that I've overlooked some blatantly obvious problem that, you know, anybody just walking in would find it. Um, you know, another thing that it, it does bother me, but I'm, you know, I understand it, is the speed at which it takes, or the lack of speed, uh, which it takes some of the controls to be developed and deployed. Um, but there's really, a, that's the environment. That's, you know, that's the culture. And things do get done, um, just not quite as quickly as I would like it, them to be done in some cases. So that's probably, those are probably the two biggest things for me. One of the lessons that um, I considered putting up, but in the end we didn't, um, because there is not a lesson that is specific to higher ed, is the realization that as an information security group or an information security individual, is that you are not alone out in the world. Um, participate in security communities, go to conferences like this, become a member of, for higher ed uh, specific things like REN ISAC the, or, or any other information sharing environment. Um, if you can afford it, sign up for, for FIRST, the Forum for Incident Response and Security Teams. Get your information feeds and know what's going on because in the end you will not be able to catch everything that is going on on your network. I mean, we've all seen the presentations um, in, the, in the past more than once um, where the facts that come out is that three quarters of all incidents or all breaches are reported by outside entities, not by internal detection. And unless you are open and willing to take those reports, um, I said there's a lot of interesting stuff on your network, there's a, and amongst that interesting stuff is a lot of bad stuff. And a lot of that bad stuff will be found by external entities. In, play a role and be open to listen to the rest of the community and give back. Um, don't just sit there and take in information, but if you see stuff going on, even if it's something mundane like the 10th port scan originating from the same IP address, just do a favor, shoot out an email and report it back to someone. Um, we had another issue a while ago where um, we got a, an email from a faculty member that received a spam message. Um, well, how many do we get? Um, uh, tons. And this guy, um, this time he took particular offense to it because he interpreted it as hate mail. So we took a look at it and said, yeah, well, if you really want to consider this hate mail, you could consider it hate mail. It's not an IT problem, by the way. If you consider this hate mail, go talk to legal affairs, not to us. But at the same time, what we did do is we looked briefly at the email headers and we found out it was coming from a company not too far away from us. So we gave him a call because we had met him the week before at, at the regional uh, gathering. Say, hey, do you know that your email system is relaying um, messages out? And they didn't know. And they had just acquired another small company uh, where their machine was misconfigured and on their network. And just by picking up that phone and giving them that call, they were able to basically take down that system that shouldn't be using anymore. They were able to stop an email run of 10,000s of emails going out every hour. Um, and just that little gesture that you make, which does not take any effort, and picking up the phone and calling someone for five minutes is not something that will break your day. Um, but being active in the community and give back, that is something that will make not only your organization better as from a security point of view, but it will make the whole industry better, I think. Yes. Yes. We do. Um, we, one of the first things that I did, um, both Adam and I came into a position that did not exist before we came on board. Um, so my position as information security officer is just over a year old at my institution. So we had to start from scratch. And one of the first things we did was information classification and protection. And you can be very elaborate on that, um, but the other thing is important, not important. Important information you have to protect better than not important information. Um, we went a little further in that, that um, we classified on the three traditional axes. It's, is this information that is confidential, yes or no? How important is its integrity and how important is its availability? Um, and of course, it takes a long time to get all that stuff um, uh, cleared away. And in the end, it was a very good way for me to learn about I could walk into our data center and start looking at servers and see lights blinking, um, but that didn't tell me anything about how important those systems were for the end users. 
and, and by talking to them, I started to understand much more of the, their processes, and they started to listen to me. Uh, because I didn't come in telling them, stop doing this or start doing this. I st came in asking them, how are you doing this, and how can we help? And that classification is, is a big help in doing that. Yeah, we're actually engaged in a um, kind of a new server agreement between the different departments and colleges and the central IT that will help us do this, help us assess, um, just because there are just so many boxes out there that aren't controlled by central IT. Um, so we are, uh, we've actually split it off a little bit further than the three, um, just so that when it's basically a form that gets filled out every year, uh, just that the departments or the uh, colleges will tell us what the box is, what it's going to be used for, and then what types of, who we need to contact if there's a problem, and then what types of information are on there. And the goal there is then to use this, see how this information outside of the central, centrally controlled systems are being used, are being stored and protected so that we can take additional steps and have additional conversations. Uh, that classification, for example, allowed us to do a, a small, we call it a hot site, but it's really a, a very big name for a, a very small room, um, but to duplicate certain s important systems um, on site um, and, and get some stuff done because everyone agreed that if this system would be down for four days, it would be really bad, not just a little bit bad, but really bad. And the other point I have to make is that my organization is highly centralized in IT. So we have one IT office and we do everything for the whole organization, whereas um, Adams is a little uh, more decentralized. We have three. We have the central IT, um, we have the group that is responsible for the smart classrooms and the labs, and then we have, oh, then the library, so actually we have four. The library also has their own staff, and then we also have a, um, each individual college has their own tech. So kind of creates some challenges. Any more questions? If not, we'll be around for the rest of the conference. Please fill out the conference evaluations and return them to the organization so at least we get some charity donations in. Thank you.